So in this next segment, let's now move into, again, we're going to concentrate on the metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients. So again, just for definition, because I think for all of us, this is, this is common speak, but I think for a especially you know, for the urologist, but also I think in the medical oncology world and the radiation oncology world, this is, you know, as you said, Neil, this is just such a burgeoning <laughs> space. So when we talk about the castration-resistant prostate cancer patient, it's prostate cancer, androgen deprivation therapy, testosterone level less than 50, rising PSA, and again, in the M1 space, we're talking about patients who radiographically have a positive scan. Now, whether that be soft tissue, bone, whether that be bone scan, CT, or sodium fluoride PET. So as, as we all know, as, as we have alluded to, prior to 2010, the only agent that was approved that had a survival benefit was docetaxel. And again, over the past four years, we have had these explosion of therapies. But however, dos, you know, docetaxel really still does have some value. So, Oliver, you, you know, being the medical oncologist, thoughts about docetaxel historically, where we stand now, especially in light of the guidelines, what you're seeing clinically, uh, what's coming into your clinic, especially as the urologist, hopefully, have been more active in, 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 in identification. Well, it's, it's really been fascinating. First of all, you know, you have to sort of look at it from an evolutionary perspective. You go back to 2003, and we didn't have anything that would prolong survival. And docetaxel in 2004 was a big step forward. We finally had something that would be able to prolong survival for these patients. But I think it was actually even more important than that. It, it sort of took away some nihilism. I think prior to 2004, there was a feeling that, oh, these old guys, we're not going to help them, we're just going to hurt them. And, you know, all of a sudden, there was a sense that maybe we really can benefit these patients. And that laid the groundwork for the explosion of positive trials we've had since 2010. So docetaxel still has a very important role. I still use docetaxel. Saw a patient yesterday having a fabulous response. But at the same time, we now have so many choices that a lot of the newer hormones are coming into the fore earlier. We, of course, have the abiraterone approval, and soon we're going to have an enzalutamide approval in the pre-chemo space, and, of course, the simple cell T in the asymptomatic patient. So we now have more choices, and my practice probably reflects these new choices with docetaxel being less prominent than it was in the past. What about, because the other agent that, that obviously is more commonly used for the medical oncologist, not so much for the urologist is, is cabazitaxel. So we know it's approved in the post-chemotherapeutic space after docetaxel. It does have a survival benefit. Uh, you're probably the only one, on this panel at least, that has extensive experience with it. Give us your thoughts about uh, Jeftana or cabazitaxel. Well, you know, it's very interesting. I was uh, co-PI on the international trial, uh, which we published in Lancet. and. In the trial, there was a pretty substantial degree of febrile neutropenia. We obviously had the prolongation of survival, but it's about 7.5% febrile neutropenia. That, that, I think, made a lot of people very cautious. I have been using it with growth factors, and in that context, the febrile neutropenia rate is dramatically lower. I mean, certainly less than 2%. And in the U.S., it turns out that that's a readily available agent. It turns out ex-U.S., the growth factors are not quite so available. And in the international trial, the utilization of growth factors in the first cycle was prohibited, actually. So what I can say on the cabazitaxel front is, first of all, it's an active agent. In fact, is it's really active in some patients, particularly those individuals that have been on docetaxel, initially responded and then later progressed. Very good agent. The initial clinical trial data on the febrile neutropenia can, can be substantially mitigated by the use of growth factors, and I use it in virtually all my patients that way. It's a good agent, it's an active agent, and interestingly, it's quite well tolerated. We have a uh, little abstract coming out in the European meetings showing that the neuropathy risk is lower than with docetaxel, the alopecia risk is lower than with docetaxel, and it turns out that you can get people going on it pretty readily. So a uh, good agent, uh, very clearly defined in its space, the post-docetaxel failure, 
not used in the first line setting, uh, but a better agent, I think, than what the initial trial might have, might have given the impression of. Isn't there some, in terms of the mechanism of action, doesn't it have some effect on the androgen receptor as well in terms of translocation into the nucleus? It, it does. You know, that's a relatively new finding. Uh, when the drug was developed, that was not appreciated. And this is also true for docetaxel as well. So the studies are, are really as follows, exactly as you stated. During the binding of the ligand in the androgen receptor, which is a cytoplasmic event, after that ligand binds, there's a translocation of the ligand-bound androgen receptor into the nucleus. That translocation probably has a microtubular component. And it could be that that's the mechanism whereby both docetaxel and cabazitaxel actually inhibit androgen action. If you look in the in vitro setting, this is unequivocally clear. They have beautiful transport studies to show that the taxanes inhibit that transportation.